Irish Academy of Music is one of Europe's oldest and most distinguished conservatoires. There's a very long tradition in the Academy. I mean, it goes back for over 100 years and it was set up as quite a small uh, institution, but an institution really dedicated to very high levels. We're located in Dublin City, which is the capital of Ireland, and we cater for bachelor's, master's and doctorate students in music performance, particularly classical music performance. The amount of people that we take on to the course is very important. We, we take very few people, it's very competitive, but it's, it's done in such a way that we can ensure that uh, not only do we have top quality people, but there are reasonable employment prospects. We would rarely have over 100 students at senior level, and there's a reason for this. We believe as an institution that we will do best for our students by giving them a lot of tuition time. They will usually get two hours of lessons with an international calibre teacher. We give them a lot of opportunities to perform in Ireland's best national venues. We give them an opportunity to engage in our extensive international touring programme, so they will appear in venues like Carnegie Hall or the Metropolitan Club in New York. And we also give them opportunities to engage in mentoring programmes with our national orchestras. The other thing I think is very important about the Academy, it's, it's a real hub and nexus of performance. Our institution might be 160 years old, but the passion and the ambition we have for our students to achieve their best is absolutely timeless. I look forward to receiving your application. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Tynan, Head of Vocal Studies and Opera at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. You're very welcome to the Virtual Vocal Open Day. This is our first time to present our Open Day in this format, and I hope you enjoy the afternoon. To start, I'd like to introduce you to the Vocal Faculty. We have an extraordinary range of professors who teach voice, and they include Mary Brennan, Virginia Kerr, Sylvia O'Regan, Linda Lee, Owen Gilhooley, Imelda Drum, and Sylvia O'Brien. In addition, we have our own vocal coaches who specialize in coaching our singers in vocal repertoire. And they are Dervla Collins, Andrew Sinnott, and Gráinne Dunn. We're also so fortunate to have international visiting artists such as Anne Murray and Brenda Hurley, and they come on a regular basis to coach our senior students. In addition, all of our students have a wide range of academic subjects and they are all created, those programmes are overseen by our Head of Musicianship, Marie Morn. We have a wide range of tutors that offer support in terms of performance classes, languages, yoga, acting, performance psychology, the whole gamut of what you need to develop as a young singer and prepare yourself for the career ahead. This year, the courses that we are offering include an access course, which is a one-year foundation level course for young singers who are anticipating that they might like to apply for our degree in vocal performance. We also have a one-year programme, a diploma in performance and teaching. In addition, we have our undergraduate BMOS degree. This is a four-year honours degree and it is really one of the finest degrees of its kind you can find anywhere. We have a master's two-year performance degree and a recital artist program, which is similar to a master's program without the academic components. And the recital artist program can be taken over one, two, or even three years. And at the top of our pyramid, we have the doctor in music performance degree. So these are the wide range of degree programs that we are offering in 2021. What career could you have when you graduate from the Royal Irish Academy of Music? Well, obviously, a performance career is one option, a career as a teacher, a career as a composer, a broadcaster, an arts administrator, or maybe something else. Who should apply, therefore, to study at the RIAM? We welcome applications from anyone who has a passion for music and music performance. That is at the core of everything that we do. In addition, we have a very strong policy on equality, 
diversity and inclusion. So we want you to apply. If your interest is music and performance, please come and make an application. Our core modules and the core of what we do, of course, is performance. And our students are very fortunate that they have two hours of one-to-one -one individual tuition every week with their voice teacher. And that is quite unique in my experience. In addition, they have weekly sessions with their vocal coach. A range of performance classes that become more diverse and sophisticated as they progress through their degree programmes. And ensemble, such as chamber music, our students at senior level and at master's level in particular, have an opportunity to participate in Chamber Fest Dublin, which is a wonderful new initiative that has been created by Sarah Sue, our head of strings and chamber music. In addition, opera is very central to everything that we do in the academy. Our undergraduate students are unusual in that they have an opportunity to perform roles in opera at undergraduate level. And through the course of their degree, they have experience as choristers, playing small roles, and eventually getting to star in their own large-scale production in year three or year four. Our master's students also have these opportunities. And we bring in the best of opera and theatre directors to work with our students and our own in-house conductors, Andrew Sinnott and David Adams. In addition, our productions are created in collaboration with IADT in Don Leary and the Lear Academy at Trinity College. So they're huge collaborations full of energy and vigour and every year is an exciting adventure in opera at the Academy. We also have the RIM Chorale, which is a lovely ensemble which brings together all of the singing students to work with our conductor Blonde and Murphy and we present a wide range of repertoire, including works by contemporary composers and some of the more classical repertoire. All of the academic components are also taught, harmony and counterpoint, analysis, music tech, history of music and composition. And all of this is supported by a holistic programme that includes performance psychology, yoga, community music and various other things. We support our students. So we support you if you have a learning difference, for example. We will give you one-to-one -one tuition with a bespoke tutor for your needs or extra hours of vocal coaching because we want you to progress and develop through our degree programmes. Our performance psychology is core to all of our degree programmes and Virginia Kerr, who is a professor of voice, also teaches that particular module and you will meet her later this afternoon. We also offer confidential and free counselling and student support with student leaders and academic staff giving that student support. So what were the highlights that we had last year? Well, as we all know, 2020 has been a very challenging year for all of us who work in the performing arts, but we did have our highlights. And last October, we started off with a wonderful performance at the National Gallery of Ireland, celebrating the paintings of Soroya. And that was led by our international visiting artist, Anne Murray, working with our year four and our masters and recital artist students. And it was such a lovely way to start the year. We had a full scale production of Cavalli's La Calisto in January, directed by Sinead O'Neill and conducted by David Adams at the Project Art Centre. And that was just a beautiful production in collaboration with the design for stage and screen students at IADT Dunleary. And the RAM Chorale performed two major works last year, which is so exciting now for us to look back on. One of them was Colin Mauby's The Heavenly Christmas Tree for Christmas, and the other was the Irish premiere of Annalise by James Whitbourne. And this year, we continue to perform despite the restrictions that we have placed upon us. So I'm really delighted to say that we've just had our performance spotlight week. Um, and that's a week that was devoted just to rehearsal and performance. And you're going to hear some of the fruits of that week shortly, some lovely recordings of Schubert ensembles with our younger singers. We are really very excited this year that we can present our opera production in collaboration with IADT. And it is Kevin O'Connell's world premiere of an opera called Dreamcatcher. 
This opera was originally conceived for the stage. However, we are reinterpreting and reimagining it as a film. And it's a very exciting performance opportunity for our students and indeed for all of the students in IEDT at the National Film School and at Design for Stage and Screen that are collaborating with us. Last week, we started to record the audio for the opera and we will now be moving forward in January to record all of the film and video elements of it. So you can look forward to seeing that on a screen sometime next year. The other highlights that we're looking forward to in 2021 include some very special work that has been created by the master's students. They this year have taken the initiative of creating some of their own performance projects. Um, they're creating a beautiful Liederabend as part of the Chamber Music Festival and they're also going to be presenting two short operas, an opera by Jonathan Dove and by Pergolesi. So you can look forward to seeing that as well. So how do you apply to the Royal Irish Academy of Music? This year, all of our applications are via video application online. The closing date for all our applications is December the 1st. Please remember that date, it is so important. Tuesday, December the 1st. To upload your applications, you must go to the RIAM website, www.riam.ie. We are not part of the CAO process. So you must apply directly to the Academy in order to apply to audition for our degree programmes. All of our degrees are accredited by Trinity College Dublin, which is also a really wonderful kind of stamp of approval for what we do. The auditions will actually take place in late January. We will consider all the applications and we will make our first offers in early March. So now I'm actually going to hand you over to two of our graduates, Gemini Vrian and Sarah Brady, who are going to share some of their special memories about being students at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Some of my Academy memories, I probably have too many to mention because I absolutely loved my time at the Academy. It's such a lovely family environment because it's so small, the class sizes are small, you get to know absolutely everybody in the college from first year all the way up to fourth year, masters, doctorate students. We're all in the same building. We were all together and that really appealed to me. Um, some of my favourite memories are from the opera productions we did. We were so lucky that we got to do like full scale opera productions with costume and hair and makeup, singing with an orchestra, collaborating with IADT. So you're not just learning how to sing you're learning how to collaborate and be part of a production which is what opera is it's not just you by yourself it's you plus a million other people and learning to work with other people and just having an absolute ball um also we got to do my one of my standout moments ever is we sang uh, Mahler's second symphony with um choirs from all over ireland and there was about 200 musicians on stage and it's just one of those moments that I will never forget. The music is incredible. And it was just one of those moments that you're like, wow, lucky to be a singer and lucky to be here and get to do this. My name is Sarah Brady and I'm a soprano who graduated from the Royal Irish Academy of Music in 2016. I chose to study at the Royal Irish Academy of Music because I simply fell in love with the place when I visited it. The environment, the, how competitive it felt, how challenging, how intense, how focused, but also how supportive it felt and how encouraging it felt. But there are really, really good teachers at the academy and they take care of you and they'll become in a way family or a friend to you. They're not just a teacher, you know, and this is what the academy really felt like. It really felt like a family. I would recommend any singer who feels that they just have to be on the stage. I think you should just apply. There's not much more I can say. If you have a love for it and you want to be on the stage making music, then just apply. You will not regret it. And now you're going to meet Owen Gilhooley, one of the professors in the vocal faculty. And joining him will be some of our current RIAM students. And they're going to chat about their life at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. 
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our breakout room. Delighted to be joined by some of our undergraduate students as well as some of our master's students. My name is Owen Gilhooley. I'm a professor of singing at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, and I'm leading this breakout room this afternoon. I'd love to start by talking to some of our undergraduate students about their experiences um, through the courses. We have students varying from first year to uh, master's year, year two, um, but we also have somebody who uni uniquely has been on our access course and then gone on to join our Bachelor of Music course, and that is David Kennedy. So I'd like to hand over to David to give us a little bit of feedback and a, a little bit of uh, insight into his year on the access course and how that then has affected the move into the Bachelor of Music course. Hi, David. Hi, Owen. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so I did the um, I did the access course and I found the access course was a really great year to kind of um, establish a founding in classical music. I felt like at the time uh, I wasn't too sure whether I wanted to go into musical theatre or classical music and uh, it really it really gave me the time to kind of step back and to experience what being a full-time student um, doing classical music uh, was like. Um, during my time in the access course, you know, you, you go through um, harmony and counterpoint classes, hour of classes, Italian diction, you do the performance classes, and then you get your hour of lessons and you get time with a repetitor. And it, it, it was a really great year for me to kind of uh, establish a, a, a strong foundation in classical music and to uh, kind of establish myself in so many different aspects of music from like vocal science to the language aspect to the the H and C aspect um, and not only did I grow as a musician I felt like I grew, grew socially and I got to meet everybody and I got to kind of learn the workings of the academy and 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 really um, kind of the, my love for music really grew from from the year and I feel like from doing that year I 100% wanted to, to go the classical route and to do classical music. Great. And I know you also took on some extra modules as well because you wanted that extra that extra challenge. Push. Extra push. <laughs> how did how did that actually sit in into the year for you? The extra modules. Yes. Yeah. Um. With the 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 staff, like all the staff, were really kind of welcoming for my kind of eagerness of of learning. Um. It, 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 I think I think doing the access year, it's a great year, and you really have to be motivated towards towards it and uh, I did uh, extra modules of um, I think it was uh, German diction and I did um, um, harmony and counterpoint in the, from the diploma classes and the arrow class from the diploma classes and um, it was all really really um, enjoyable for me because I, I really got to to kind of go that extra mile and to kind of to kind of experience to experience to kind of push myself in the year and I really feel like that that's the way to go if you go about doing the access year. Okay, great. So, do you feel that it gave you gave you uh, um, a good platform then for moving into the the bachelor's course? That you you slightly feel a step ahead because you've tackled some of the maybe tougher elements of these modules um, just before even even starting when you were in your exploratory year. Definitely, I feel like coming into first year now that I've done the access course, I have that have that foundation and I have the structure. Uh, on how the academy works already kind of down. So I feel like coming in from the access year into first year has really kind of given me that edge. Uh, it's, it's given me that kind of um, knowledge on the workings and the material. I've already covered some of the material that we're kind of going back on in first year. And it, it's, it, it's, it's a lot more comfortable now that I know how everything works, if you get me. Yes. And um, what, kind of, what kind of students or people would you recommend the access course to? I would recommend the act. I recommend the access course to anybody, but I, I would recommend the access course to people who who either aren't sure whether they they want to go into classical music because obviously it's a very demanding degree, but it's also a very demanding career. Um, I feel like it's great to kind of to kind of to kind of get, get a founding in classical music, and I feel like it, it's it's great for anybody who's just not one hundred percent sure whether classical music is is for them. And I feel like I've benefited greatly from from doing it, and I'm all all for it now. Oh, brilliant! And now that you've you've transitioned into first year of the of the degree course, and obviously everything has uh, pivoted online. How how has the learning experience changed for you now? Obviously, with online learning, there was definitely a big it was it was definitely a big a big change. But I feel like the academy really incorporated incorporated online online learning well into their into their 
into into the everyday life. Um, I feel like they they have a great they, they have a great aspect on on online learning, and it really showed the 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 the, the lengths they went to to learn more about teaching online, and 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 they kind of went that extra mile in that sense. And I feel the academy also uh, kept the the they listened to the students, and they kept the one to one lessons in person, which are I think one of the most vital aspects of the a performance degree in person. Um, which um, I felt that they, they really listened to the students on that aspect, and and I'm really thankful for that. So we've all been on a on a on a on a massive learning curve with regard to this, and the academy pivoted online very quickly in March when the the first lockdown came, and uh, we all had to we all had to upskill very 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 quickly and uh, and adjust. It's great, as you say now, that that we are where we are, and we are able to have our one to one lessons because. Um, it does make a massive difference. You can achieve an awful lot online, um, especially the academic stuff, but that that interaction, that integ in, in, integration interaction, it's a completely different thing um, in a live lesson. Um, so I might go to Anna Helena now, who's a second year BMOS student. And if, you, if you'd like to uh, give, give us a little um, taster of your, of your experience at the Academy over the last We'll say a year and a half, even though it's not quite that yet. Sure, thanks, Owen. Um, I think one of the things that really attracted me to the academy was there's such a big um, like emphasis on performance, whereas in some of the other degrees offered here in Ireland, there's not as much emphasis on performance. So like we would get two hours of individual lessons a week, which is obviously huge because a lot of other conservatoires would only offer one hour. And I think when you stop and think about it, that actually is really significant because you're actually getting double the teaching you would get anywhere else. And then on top of that, you obviously have your session with your vocal coach once a week. And you also have both of the performance classes. And even in some of our academic classes, it's all linking into the performance. So I think the academy really tries to give the students the best chance that they can have of having a successful performance degree, but we also have the benefit of getting a good grounding in the academic musical world so that we have the option to do both. Great, that's great. And have there been any, any particular highlights for you for you so far? Um, I really enjoyed, we have these spotlight weeks um, throughout the year where we kind of abandon academic classes and just work on a project either individual projects or a project as a group. Um, so last year we did a concert as a chorale for the, in the St. Anne's Church, I think. Um, and we performed Annalise, which was a piece about Anne Frank's life, which was really interesting and a lot of fun to get to work as a choir. And there was also um, opportunities for soloists in that piece as well. And it's just a lot of fun to come together and create music as well as working on your solo performance great so you feel like the structure of of, of the course then is kind of tiered and, and layered in order that you're you've actually got a direction and you're upskilling in every year that you move into rather than being completely overloaded at, at, at first yeah definitely i think they structure the course really well so that you're always challenged but you're not overwhelmed by the amounts of information coming at you but there's definitely the challenge there if you look for it and everyone within the academy is really trying to help you grow and expand both as an artist and a person so i find that really helpful as well fantastic so it's not for the it's not for the faint-hearted uh with <laughs> the repertoire that you that, that that everybody has to learn because for these long long mid or long end of year programs and concertos and everything else that goes with the courses so we have neve she now who's in a fourth year fourth year undergraduate who has uh been, been through the been through the, the, the almost the entire mill at this stage with with regards to a learning curve can you give a little bit of feedback um so when i started in the academy i was severely inexperienced i had basically no performing opportunities like i'm from a really small town really small school music was not at the forefront of my learning so like i couldn't sight sing to save my life um and my just music theory was 
not there. And, you know, starting in the academy, I made them very aware of this coming in. And then I have dyslexia as well, which is also wonderful. But um, making all the lecturers and all aware, they were so good. And like all of them are so patient. And I think having such small classes, like there's seven in my year, and you know we're always constantly working off each other and working together and you start from the basics in year one so it's not like you have to have this massive you know music theory level coming in or experience at all like it's always it starts in the groundwork and you build up together and like you're you're doing group work in classes like canons and all this kind of stuff and you you're kind of at the start you're kind of like oh my god this is insane what's going on but you slowly start to like get into it get into it and lectures are always there you know to help you out and you know if you need any extra classes they're constantly on top of it um and I have also had the incredible experience of being in two operas at the moment. So in my second year, I was in the first Irish production of Banished by Stephen McNeff. And we got to do that in Kilmainham Jail. So it's not every day you can say that I performed an opera in a jail because it just doesn't happen. Um, and like, it's just such an insane experience. And like the Academy goes above and beyond to get you these experiences and make sure that you're performing in good spaces and places that you won't forget. And we're doing Dreamcatcher now, which is by Kevin O'Connell, who is a lecturer in the college. And, you know, it's been tough because I do an opera in the middle of a pandemic and the academy completely worked around it and they're turning it into an opera film which is crazy and we're getting like all this experience you know we're going to be working um not only with like orchestras and conductors and everything which is in itself is incredible experience but we're now going to be working with like film crews and you know IADT with their incredible costume designs and like uh recording studios like it's insane and it's all accommodating for the students it's how we learn and it's going to impact us when we leave the college so it's an incredible mm. experience <laughs> that's pretty that's pretty that's pretty impressive and it's also one thing to have prepared to prepare to have prepared an opera to put on the peacock stage i think it was at the abbey wasn't it and then yeah the pandemic struck we went into <laughs> lockdown and it's had to be completely reimagined so i guess you guys now are, are layering what you're what you're doing so you an extra set of skills there with regard to i suppose recording and then when it comes to your filming you'll be you'll be doing scene by scene and it'll 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 be a completely different ex experience because uh, the videographer will want one thing and you're yeah. want another <laughs> exactly <laughs> be prepared for uh, uh, any eventuality but it should it should um it should turn it should turn out as something really really interesting i think yeah. great thank you neve um we're very lucky this afternoon to have two former undergraduates with us as well who have now moved on to the m moz course we have caroline bean and matthew mannion and i'd love to have a chat to caroline first give us a wave as i said hi everyone <laughs> Um, so yeah, as Owen said, I've just finished my degree at the Academy and I've continued on to do my Masters now. Um, so i just really like to echo absolutely what everything that everyone has said already. And I think one of the nicest things about the Academy is the numbers are so small. So you build such an amazing like support network around you. Everybody knows everyone like from first year right up to doctorate level. And everyone is there for each other like at all times so it's so nice like especially with singing it's such a personal journey as well it's so lovely to you know everyone's there for each other so you find oh you're not the only one that's finding this difficult and just to have that support is a big big help and um, which is like you really do become a family at the academy and then like there's such incredible performance opportunities I was very lucky that I was involved in an opera every year of my degree and it really like it was such a journey through that as well so like in first year my first opera was an offstage chorus then the next year was an onstage chorus third year we had all had small little roles 
And then when we got to final year, then we were ready to take on the leading roles in La Calisto, which we performed in the Project Arts Centre. So that was an incredible experience to work with our conductor, David Adams, the director, Sinead O'Neill. And it was really like a full circle moment how we'd gone from an offstage chorus and carried right through to performing the leading roles in a, quite a challenging opera. So, yeah. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite an arc of, 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 of learning and build, yeah, definitely. building the various skills that are needed to get there and also building your confidence. <laughs> the thing is, because you, you can't take on the, you can't take on these roles if you've got that little doubt on your shoulder. And part of, part of the, uh, part of our roles as, as uh, the teaching staff is to, is to help people with their, with, with a mentoring role of, of building confidence and, you know what I mean? Making sure that you're you you bring you're able to bring your A game when you need to do it. So it it sounds like that that forms part of the of the of the process for most of you as well. Okay, so thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Matthew. Hello. Um, just to really um, concrete what Caroline was saying, how much the academy makes you feel at home. I actually started in another institution and did my first two years of my undergraduate degree there and then came into the academy in my third year and within i'd say just two weeks i it was like i had never been anywhere else everyone made me feel so at home i like you knew everyone in the red carpet area which is now unfortunately gone but there's supposed to be a new common room coming um where you just get to know absolutely everyone um and it was such a joy like and how supportive and everyone was even the staff like knew my name right when I came in. I got to know everyone really well. It was just like I'd slotted, I put on a glove that like I didn't know that I needed. Uh, it was like, it was just really fast to come into the academy. And then on top of that, as Caroline said, like there's amazing opportunities here to where I covered a role in La Finta Giardiniera. And then I did the Irish premiere of Scipio's Dream by Judith Weir um, in my third year. And then in fourth year as well, I premiered the role in Banished, uh, and then I went on actually in the Academy. It was so good, and this is something that I really, really appreciate in this institution is they were willing to work with me as I was actually cast with Irish National Opera in um, Orfeo and Eurydice, and then I had a small role in Magic Flute, and they released me to do those roles from the college. And like an, any other institution, they really wouldn't be as flexible um, but like they were so good and so supportive and all the lecturers were helping me keep up on my work. Um, my thesis advisor was so good, good and helping me write as I was crying over my thesis on tour, being like, oh my goodness, how am I going to get this done? She's like, yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, and so just really it's supportive academics and also like the creative freedom to go out and work professionally. Um, I really, really appreciated that in my undergraduate degree. And now, as you can tell, I like the academy. So I'm back here doing my master's. Um, and I'm finding it really fantastic how they pivoted to make the transition to online, but also keep a focus on having your performance classes in person. Um, and I really, really appreciate that um, because I think I would be a little bit lost if I didn't have those lessons. And we'd all be a little bit lost, I think. We'd all be. Yeah. So as 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 you know, I mean, you you're probably the you are in fact the first cohort of master's students who are having to uh, deal with uh, progressing your course through through a pandemic and not in natural causes or natural circumstances rather so you've you've had to kind of put pen to paper get your thoughts out there and actually contribute to the construction of of the course for the year so it's um, i think it's been very much student led by you guys um, Amy, would you like to tell us a little bit about that and then I'll say, say a little bit more? Absolutely. Hi everyone. Yes, so we actually this year have been challenged, the three of us, to put together some of the opportunities that the undergraduates have been mentioning in, um, in the sense that we have put together a Liederabend and that will be in conjunction with two piano students here at the academy. Um, we also have put together two opera productions. We will be putting together two opera productions. 
One will be Jonathan Dove's The Pink, which will be an Irish premiere, and the second will be a Baroque opera called La Serva Padrona by Pergolesi. And we have really just sort of come together and said, we need performance opportunities. And the Academy said, yes, you do. Give us your ideas. We want to hear what you think would work best for you. And that is very important. I'm on the second year masters. So I will be heading off into the big bad world after this, as long as I pass my thesis. <laughs> um, but you know what, once that happens, you need to have these skills. You need to have the ability to put together a, a recital whether it be a solo recital or with colleagues. You need to be able to say, you know, I've always wanted to learn this piece of music and put it out there and really properly perform it. How do I do that? Um, we'll also be challenged with figuring out, do we live stream it or will come March, we be able to have a small audience in the room? Like, how will we navigate that? Um, so it's, it's really elevated active learning and it's really exciting um but just to kind of talk to the people again we've mentioned how it's like a family at the academy i only just met matt and caroline last year my first year and i can honestly say that putting these projects together you would have thought that the three of us have been best friends for years you know it's like yeah we're gonna go get a coffee and we're gonna talk about these projects so I mean, it really you're like a little unit. It's really, it's, it's really. We are. <laughs> we are. And we go to each other for everything. Yeah. Yeah. We're texting and we're like, what are you doing today? We send voice notes, we send memes. And then, you know, a little work gets done in there too. Uh, well, a fair amount of work gets done there. <laughs> from, what, from what I can see. So, it's, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really important, I suppose, the, mess, the message is that um, the Academy is a kind of a, a bespoke institution. It only takes a certain amount, of, a certain amount of, of, of students, and there is a, there's a, an element of flexibility within the structure that has to be there as well. And, and hopefully, it's something that's going to help you all to carve out your own um, individual identities as artists. Um, or you might choose to go on a completely different path eventually. You know, you might want to be a, one of the great pedagogues. Um, you might want to go into artist management. You might want to, you know, set up your own opera company. All these things, you, you know, the, the, the courses add different layers at different times. And um, I think you're all testament to the fact that, you know, everything is possible. You know, I've seen, I've seen, I've watched all of you, or I'm watching all of you grow. And it's really exciting to watch people start to blossom at different times. And you know, once when the when the time is when the time is right, things just start to go boom. And uh, you can you can see people's confidence rise. You can see that their their learning that their learning ability then increases as well. And it can be it can be from the smallest from the smallest thing. It might just be one little technical thing that's been getting in the way and holding you back because you overthink about it. But then you guys go away and you do your practice, you do your work, and it's like then someone casts a, um, a spell almost, and you come back in and you get, yeah, I've got it. Now I know. Now I know what I'm now. Now I know where I've been going wrong. I should have been going right when I, I was going right when I should have been going left or whatever the case may be. But um, you've all, you've all, you're all terrific stu students in your in your own right, and I'm, I feel very lucky as one of the tutors to have. I think I've had all of you in my performance classes apart from Amy Rose. <laughs> so we're going. We're working on it, Owen. That'll be a this year project. Let's. We're 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 gonna we're gonna do some. I think what we'll do we'll try and do a little bit of work on Pig. I think I'd quite like to do some work on Pig. Three roles with Matthew as the Pig. <laughs> A dream <laughs> and a dream, and I think Amy Rose just just to just to um, just to tie things up a little bit. Actually, you know, you were one of our our international students, as you said. You were you arrived, and you have you've had to be incorporated into into this um, institution, and that's not an easy thing to do either. And the fact that you've said, you know, you've created this little family within it, I hope that has helped the process for you. It really has. I was actually so surprised and I shouldn't have been because it was such an easy slide in last year. Um, everybody was just so welcoming and warm and um, really encouraging right off the bat. But when I came back in September, 
students from all different degree faculties were coming up to me and saying, oh my gosh, Amy Rose, welcome home. And I was like, oh, you're so right. <laughs> I am home. <laughs> but that, you know, you need that, especially if you're an international student, just to come here knowing with pure confidence that at the end of the day, you have an entire slew of students and faculty who are standing behind you 100% and just wanting you to be the best you that you can possibly be and you know also let you get a little weird sometimes and that's okay yeah you that's, know there's no judgment <laughs> that's all part of the journey it's all part of the journey you know what i mean if you can't if you can't go a little bit crazy as a, as a performance uh, as a performance student and cross that line um then where else can you do it right exactly this is the place now is the time to get weird Now's the time to now's the time to push yourself and challenge yourself, and I think you're all doing that. And and anyone who's looking to uh, apply to the course, I think, um, you can you can all uh, testify to the fact that th there is space for that kind of uh, we'll call it madness, a form a form of madness to actually explore all these marvelous operatic characters or the deep poetry of of uh, from from Schumann and Brahms and Schubert and all all these great composers that they, you know there are so many elements that uh, you will find your niche in in whatever shape or shape or form and that everybody's journey is slightly different sometimes you know one person flies straight away and then the next person is just a little bit takes a little bit longer and everything else but with some patience and some some hard work i think generally we all get to where we're meant to where we're meant to be so thank you all hugely for having this chat this afternoon. Um, maybe you'll give a, a little wave and an, a little wave of encouragement to any would-be um, applicants and tell them to get their applications in by December 1st. Thanks very much, guys. See you all very soon. Bye for now. Students from the Royal Irish Academy of Music, from the Access course and from the first two years of the degree course, we're going to sing for you a very beautiful ensemble piece by Schubert called Stenschen, not the famous one, but a different one. We have Anna here, who is outside the bedroom door of her lover, and she's getting ready to knock and very excited about going inside. She has brought her surround sound, which are the voices inside her head, also very excited. And they decide, however, in the end, to leave the boyfriend inside the room asleep, because what could be better than sleep?
lover has gone off with another woman, and she is sort of half crazy, half crazed. And Monteverdi gave very interesting instructions for this piece. He would like the men's parts to be done in the tempo of the hand, with the tempo of the hand, and the soloist then is completely free to sing with the expression of her heart. Thank you. No, no. Yeah. Hey. 
the performances from last week. You can all clap if you, if you like it. I think that was really exciting to see uh, the all-female ensemble, the all-male ensemble. Really great work. Thanks so much to David Adams for working with the singers last week and creating that really energizing and fun learning experience together. The next video clip you're going to see is actually uh, a short little film of our production of The Magic Flute. And the magic, you saw Sarah Brady earlier on. She was one of our alumni that spoke. Sarah sang the role of Pamina in this production. So you can look out for her. But it was a fantastic, fun, vibrant production. We presented it in the Samuel Becker Theater in Trinity College, in the campus of Trinity College. It was directed by Tom Creed, um, who's a leading young Irish theater and opera director. It was conducted by Andrew Sinnott. And it had a stellar cast, is all I can say. Uh, I hope you enjoy this little mini film of the magic flute.
Christian Gober, who is going to watch that uh, small film, a condensed version of that amazing production of the Magic Flute that we did in, I think, 2016. So not that long ago. And so many amazing uh, students uh, have graduated. I was just looking through them and so, so some of them have gone into performance. Some of them have gone into artist management, actually. Three of the people in that video have gone on that arts administration path. So it just goes to show that all the different diverse careers that you can pursue when you complete your performance degrees at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. The next section, we're going to actually focus on two very interesting things now for, for all singing students. Virginia Kerr, in addition to being one of our vocal professors, also teaches our performance psychology classes. Now, these classes are offered to all students on all degree programs for the duration of their degree programs. And Virginia is going to do a session now for you, specifically for you people here today, just talking through different things to do with performance anxiety, etc. I don't want to spoil her session anyway. It will be about half an hour of her time for you, shared with you. And after that, Deborah Collins and I are going to actually do a session on audition techniques. We're going to, you're going to see some extracts from Matthew Mannion, Amy Rose Willett, Caroline Bean, who really generously sent us in some little clips of arias that they have recently recorded. And Deborah and I are going to watch some of the extracts and chat about it and just give you some feedback on what we would advise you to do when you're preparing a video application. Mm -hmm. So please stay with us. We have these two very interesting sessions coming up now, one after the other. So I'm going to hand over to Virginia Kerr. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Gosh, watching that magic flute brought back a lot of memories. That was um, a really fantastic production. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is kind of a, a sort of a whistle-stop tour through, um, now I've got back to myself but I want to see who's yes that's it that's I just want to see people I don't want to be looking at myself um yeah it's um it's kind of a little whistle stop tour through performance psychology and what we do at the academy and um I'm just wondering if somebody might like to just tell me what do you think and don't please don't be afraid to speak up it's very informal so nothing you say is going to be wrong just throw something at me what do you think performance psychology might be? I know there are some other people that I can't actually see, so... Um, controlling emotions. Controlling emotions, absolutely, yeah. So when you're, you know, if you're standing on the stage, how you control your emotions. So um, somebody else might like to come in? What do you think it might be? What do you think we might study in performance psychology? Sarah, I can see you there. You've done it. So tell me, tell me maybe something that you might think you've done. We've, we've done. Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I feel like the controlling our emotions part is, is kind of, uh, sorry, I was going to say on the nose, but I don't I think that's the right expression. But I feel like uh, understanding your emotions like on and off stage and like knowing how to deal with them to to, I guess, personally, I would say, let them not hinder my performance, but like, it can go the other way around as well, like, enhance it, I guess, you know, absolutely. just stay with them. Yeah, thank you. That's absolutely, absolutely it. It's really the study of the mental, emotional, and rational components behind performance. So, you know, if we can understand how we feel when we go out to perform then, and we can look after our, our mental well-being and our physical well-being, we develop our self-awareness and then we are in a better place. We get ourselves into a better place to stand out on the stage. Because, you know, being a performer, as most of you who have, I'm sure you've all been singing from, you know, doing lots of concerts and performances from time to time, but since you started, um, you, you know, you have to walk out on the stage and look as if you're completely in control. So it reminds me of um, like, you know, you go, if you walk in Stevens Green or you go to anywhere, a lake and you see swans on the lake and you'll see ducks on the lake and they look as if they're gliding along beautifully. And you're there thinking, gosh, this is just so peaceful and so gorgeous. And they, they've just got it and they do it right. And they just look as if they're just gliding along without a care in the world. 
but I'd wonder if we were underneath the water, what would we see? We'd see these little feet going flying, flapping away underneath, keeping, keeping themselves going. And that's what happens. We're on the stage and there's a lot going on, but we have to put it across to the audience that actually it's perfect. You know, I've got this. You don't have to worry. You just have to sit back and enjoy it. So it's kind of how do we how do we do that? So in the performance psychology lectures here at the Academy, we talk about well-being, developing our self-awareness so that we can look after our well-being better. We have boundaries. What do we put in boundaries? How does how do we manage boundaries? Um, mindfulness. You know, when you're out on the stage and your mind, you might make a mistake in your, in your eyes. There might be a blip in the first couple of bars of your performance. Do you still have that in your head by the end of the song? I know sometimes I do. I might go out and I'll have done something in the first bar, forgotten a word or made up a word or done something. That stays with me. So how do we manage to get ourselves to a point where we can let that go and really be in the moment of the piece until the end of the piece? And then when you come off the stage, you can think, yeah, I made that mistake or I made that mistake or whatever. But it's just moving on from anything that might happen at the beginning. So you're not carrying that right through the whole way. So it's bringing your mind back to where you are. OK, so does the, if anybody has any questions, please do stop me if you don't agree with something or if you don't understand something. Just stop me and say, can we go back over that or actually can I ask a question? So mindfulness is really important. Um, resilience. You know, how do I manage everything? How do I get out there? I have three performances and I'm lots of stuff to learn and I've got rehearsals. And how do I manage all that? And then the big one the anxiety. I get out on the stage and I start feeling very shaky or things, you know, lots of different things start happening and my mind is going. So today, I think maybe given that I'm hoping some of you will be um, hoping coming to audition, applying and coming to audition for us. So maybe and the fact that you're going on into an audition session with um, Kathleen and Dervla, it might be good just to talk a little bit more about performance anxiety and how to control that. So can somebody tell me if you're going to go out on the stage for a concert or for an exam or for an audition, what do you what do you think you need? And this can be a personal thing. So somebody tell me, what do you think you need going out on the stage? And I see Amy Rose there and I see Matt there. So please, you know, jump in because that might help other people to, um, uh, to, to contribute as well. So what do you think? Maybe just kick us off with something. Um, so going out onto the stage, things that you need for an audition, I definitely need to take a deep breath, a big, deep cleansing breath to kind of get myself into the mental mindset of I'm going out and I'm going to perform. It's not a physical thing, but it's definitely an internal thing that helps sort of settle me in that mindset. Okay, so you've got to settle yourself. Yes. Okay. Anna Elena, can you tell me what, what, what do you sort of think you need? What does it take for you to walk out onto the stage? What things do you think you need? Um, I think it always really helps me to try and get into the character of the piece and um, that kind of helps to distract me from my nerves and uh, helps me focus more on what I'm trying to convey to the audience rather than getting caught up in my head. Okay so you're thinking about the composer and what does the composer want here and if you're in a role in an opera if you're singing an aria then what's 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 the What's my role? What's my character saying or, or doing or thinking? And sometimes that can be really good because suddenly you're not you anymore. You're the character. So in a way you can hide, you can hide behind the character. And that's, that's, um, that can work very well. 
So if you have uh, sort of anxiety and it's everybody has that. So please don't sort of say, well, I'm not going to say that I have anxiety because the rest of them probably haven't. And at least the one that, you know, Matt and Amy Rose and Anna Lynn, they don't have it at all. Of course they do. Of course they do. So what happened? How do you think your performance anxiety, if you have it, what do you think? How does it show itself physically? What happens? For myself, I find that my breath gets very high um, okay. and that I get shaky hands and I'm just going on stage with some jazz hands and I'm like, oh no. So I find a lot of tension, like tense and release exercises really help me. Right. Um, and a lot, I stretch before I go on stage. Um, but what I'm finding really helps my, my anxiety before I go on stage is actually my mindset of say before an audition, I have to think of these people are only looking here like to, to hear good things. They want to hear everything. They're not here to pick up my mistakes. They're not here to, to that. Like, this is a great opportunity. I find like that I just have to reinforce all the positives and then my body just settles. Okay. And so I found that in the last year. Right. Okay. Uh, Thanks, so Matt. Very late. <laughs> <laughs> it's better late than never. Believe me, I'm still finding it. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting. I, I don't know how many I, I can only see about um, I, think I can only be, see about seven or eight people on my screen. So I know there are more. So if anybody just if if I don't call out a name or something, just just jump in. Um, one of the reasons that we get sort of physical feelings in our bodies is because it's fight. I'm sure you've heard of this fight or flight. So sort of in prehistoric man would have been out in a jungle fighting to, to hunting for food. He meets a tiger. He can either kill the tiger or he can run like hell. Now, either things need a lot of adrenaline. OK, so the body fills up with adrenaline either to fight or to run. Now, take yourselves out, out onto the stage. Your body is full of adrenaline. Now you can fight the audience. Well, good luck with that one. You can fight or you can run and you don't want to do that either because it's a good gig and you want to do it and you've worked hard. So you've got all this adrenaline. So what happens with that? Because that's what it is. So it's not, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack and I'm going to die. That's not going to happen. It's you have too much adrenaline in your body because your body's response to a situation where you might feel slightly out of control or judged or any of those things, your body's response is to run or to fight. So the response doesn't change, but the situations change, of course. So as I said, you don't fight the audience and you don't run from them. So we have all this adrenaline. So you get palpitations and what Matt was saying, his breath gets short, perspiration, dry mouth, the throat gets tight. Shaky hands, shaky knees, shaky voice, even worse. Dizziness in, in, in extreme cases, nausea, feeling like I want to go to the loo. You might have gone to the loo 10 times and just before you're leaving the dressing room, actually, I've got to go to the loo again. You don't, it's this, it's the, it's the body, it's the adrenaline, it's pressing down on the bladder and that is what you don't want to go at all. But understanding these symptoms, you know, like, for instance, if the heart rate is because the activity in the lungs, the, the palpitations come because the activity is in the lungs and the airwaves are widening. So we get breathless. And because there's all this extra activity, we start getting palpitations. Sometimes you can get very sharp vision. You know, and uh, has, it has an aftermath in a sort of visual disturbance you start getting dry mouth because the digestive system is sort of turned upside down a bit. So these are all the physical things. Then can somebody give me a few psychological symptoms that might happen? And I'm going to pick somebody here. Is it Kira? I see your name there. Can you tell me and feel free? Nothing is wrong here. There's no right or wrong about any of this. Just give me, a, a, a sort of physical or a, sorry a psychological symptom that might happen you're walking on the stage what might happen I feel like if you're thinking you're kind of setting yourself up for fail if you think from the offset you're going to do something wrong 
then you're thinking too much about like lyrics or the melody or whatever and then you're bound to get something wrong exactly so you're thinking gosh i might forget yeah you know i'm a great believer in knowing your music so well that if you forget it you can make it up and nobody will notice so you make up the words but you know it so well that you don't go oh god i've forgotten what you do is oh crikey i can't remember the next word but something will come but it's often happened to me that I'd be there going, I can't remember the beginning of the second verse. I'm in the first verse, mind you. I'm not, haven't even got to the second verse. I can't remember the beginning of the second verse. I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't remember. And then I won't remember. But if I can calm myself down and if I can tell myself, actually, just go back to where you are and the second verse will come because you've been singing this piece for years. You know it. And it does happen. So we are the negative, the, the psychological symptoms would be negative thoughts. The last time I sang this, I went wrong. I'm going to do it again. But you won't do it again. You have to change your thoughts. I'm not going to do that again. That, this is a new time. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to make that mistake. We, when we get nervous, we're fearing being judged. But the audience are out there and they want you to do well because they've paid their money and they're really enjoying themselves. So when you come off the stage or, you know, and somebody says to you, you were wonderful, you were gorgeous. I really love that. Don't say, yeah, but I went wrong in the second bar or actually my voice didn't spin properly. Don't do that. Just say thank you, because nine times out of ten, they won't have noticed. And you can say that to your teacher the next day. But just, you know, be gracious, say yes, thank you very much. So if you're getting ready for an audition, these people want you to sing well. They're not there to catch you out. So if you can just say to yourself, OK, I'm not going to be judged here. And tell that inner critic person that sits on your shoulder telling you, well, that wasn't very good now. That wasn't great. The last time you sang that, you didn't sing very well. Or the last audition you did, you didn't get it. That's the negative voice. Tell him to shut up. Because there's a positive voice on the other shoulder who really wants to be heard, but isn't really getting a look in. And we do that all the time anyway. So we have to be we have to be careful of that. Self-doubt. Try and build yourself up. So those would be some of the psychological symptoms. So you can see how physically and psychologically performance can be difficult. OK. So that's why we have to be good to ourselves. We have to be kind to ourselves. So it puts a lot of demands on us. So in performance psychology, we learn how to look after ourselves in that. How can I make myself be in the best possible place? Sometimes performing, I, I think some of the guy, David, you might bear me out on this. I think sometimes the performing in college for students you know, getting up in front of your peers for your first song class. Tell me, David, what did you think about that? Was that difficult? It is a little bit because you you, you don't you don't know the people. Do you know, um, it's different towards, you know, the, the last one at the end of the year, you've been with the group for the whole year, so you're so comfortable with them. But on the first day, you don't really know who who, who, who these people are yet. And you don't know what their strengths are, and you're just kind of, kind of showing them what you can do. And I, and I think it, the first day, it's definitely a nerve-wracking experience. Yeah, but I, it's a good learning curve as well because then you kind of, it kind of brings you closer together in a way. Yeah, because everybody is the same, you know. And I've noticed, you know, in my career of singing opera, the first day of rehearsals, everybody comes in very dressed up and sings as loudly as possible. And then by the end of the week everybody's kind of chilled and they just come in and they sing and they might mark for a bit or they might, you know, whatever, but it's not, but the first day it's, it's, we're all on and we're all singing really loudly and showing what we've got. So, you know, that can happen in when you're singing in front of your peers and it can be difficult, but if you can look after your physical well being and your mental health and your, you know, just your emotional well being then you're going to be in a much, much better place. So as singers, it's difficult for us because um, we, our instruments are inside us. 
And sometimes if somebody says, you know, actually, no, you didn't get that audition or you didn't get that job. We all we almost feel as if uh, they've rejected me. Because the voice is in there. And a lot of the time you'll hear um, singers, you know, famous singers talking about the voice. The voice isn't great today or the voice is is not working or the voice. Actually, the voice was fine. It's like they take it out of themselves because it's easier. To sort of externalize it. You know, because like you can if you're feeling not very good, you could if you're a violinist or something, OK, you might not if you're not feeling great, you can still pick up your violin and you still know you'll get a sound. But sometimes if you're not feeling great in your voice, you're not sure if it's going to come out at all. So that can be difficult. And also different settings of where we're singing, you know, in a small setting. I don't know. Uh, Caroline, what do you think? Do you like being in the big operatic setting or do you like the recital setting or the oratorio or what what makes you most comfortable um i think like sometimes the bigger the audience is easier because there's a little bit of a kind of disconnect you might not actually be able to see the faces you might look out and not be able to name everyone in the front row um so i think sometimes that makes you a little bit more because you're like oh they won't I won't have to talk to them after if I make a mistake or something goes wrong whereas sometimes in like a smaller setting like people might have heard you sing that or they might like if you're talking with your friends and you're like oh I'm a bit worried about this thing they're nearly going to be anticipating you singing that bit as well so um I think in a smaller setting like you feel like the audience are nearly going through the journey with you but in a bigger setting it's a little bit more removed so you feel I personally feel a little bit more grounded like that in the in the in the bigger setting or in the yeah. smaller in the bigger setting the yeah yeah Amy Rose what about you are you do you like the smaller setting or do you like being in a big concert hall that you can't see anybody <laughs> um, I I really like both for different reasons um I love interacting with the audience so Last year when we did La Calisto, having a, a smaller, more black box style theater was really fun. Um, you could kind of see the audience's reactions to the different characters, some of which were really quirky. Um, but then in those big concert halls, you know, you just feel like the opera diva you were born to be. Right. So you're standing there and it's like, ugh. It, so it, it depends, it, it really depends, I think. Mm -hmm. For smaller, for concert pieces, like Caroline was saying, you know, having a more intimate relationship with the audience is so important. And you feel, you can feel them wanting you to do well. You can feel their encouragement. So it really encourages you to keep singing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also the, um, what we were saying earlier about having the, uh, a costume, say in an operatic setting you go out on the stage as somebody else so you put the makeup on and you have the costume and then you're out and you're not actually you anymore and some people a lot of people like that they like that setting because they can i, I use the term the hide but it, it's just they find it easier you know but there are wonderful things from from all settings because you know the operatic one of course because you're in a role and there's lots of other people the oratorio you're in the middle you have the orchestra you have other people with you and then on the recital stage you can see the audience and they as caroline says they're really with you and they want you to do well so you can feed off the audience as well so that that's really really important um, okay, I want to just see what do people normally like to do? What would you do on the day of a performance? Say, say your auditions, you're going to audition and you're called for an audition. What would you do? What do you think it's important to do? How do you prepare for it? If you don't mind, I'd like to weigh in on this. Yeah, please do. When I came for my audition, I think there are a few international students on here, prospective students on here. Um, so when I flew over for my audition in 2019, um, 
it kind of threw off my usual plan. What I normally do, I would like get up, do some yoga, have coffee, have a nice breakfast, but I was staying in an Airbnb. I had the wrong plug for my curling iron. So I wasn't sure how to do that. Um, I only had a tea kettle and no coffee pot. And I had no idea that, you know, I needed to get a French press and all that good stuff. So it was, it was a mess. Um, so I kind of had to rework my usual audition tactic <laughs> and ended up doing yoga in a practice room here at the academy, <laughs> finding coffee over at Cafe di Napoli, which is a usual haunt at this point. And, you know, just kind of renegotiating, renavigating that whole mindset and saying to myself, bottom line, I'm going to sing today and that's going to be crazy, but here we are. So. And she did and she sang very well and she's here. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I here. think pre performance routines are very important. You know, and like before your audition, if there's been something going on, you know, in your life or in the family or something, don't take it on just before the performance. Don't take it on before the audition. Just say, okay, actually, I'm not going to. If somebody wants to have a chat about a relationship or something, actually, I'm I, I'm not available today. Or I'm not, I'm not available for the next two days. I'll talk to you about that when my audition is finished or when my concert is finished. You have a right to say that because you've got to get into the best possible frame of mind to walk on the stage. So it's... It's okay to say, no, I can't do that. Or I can't, I can't go out and wash the car for you just before I go off to my rehearsal and then to my concert. That it's okay to say, no, I'm just picking that's kind of a silly example, but you know what I mean? So it's really, really important. So what I'd like you to do is if you get breathing, as we've said, and as Matt pointed out earlier, is really important. So for the last few minutes, I just would like you to Think about this, if you find that you're getting a bit shaky, just ground yourselves. And the best way to do that is just to sit quietly and concentrate on your five senses, okay? So maybe just take a minute, maybe close your eyes and take a minute to think of something that you can hear. and something then that you can smell. Maybe something you can taste. Something that you can touch. And then in your mind's eye, something that you can see. Just sit with that for a minute and breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just sitting quietly, just going with the rhythm of your breath. If your thoughts come floating past, let them just float away. And I'm kind of wondering how many times you do that for yourselves. So in that, just visualize your performance. Visualize arriving, the place that you're going to sing, having your rehearsal with your accompanist, going into the room, singing your piece, from start to finish, visualize it. And then leaving the room at the end. All the time building yourself up with positive self-talk. I can do this. 
I'm well prepared, which is the most important thing. Try to see your anxiety as excitement. See your audience as your friends. Develop a good pre-performance routine that will help you. Make sure that your eating, your exercise and your sleeping habits are good. Maybe try to limit your time on technology. And when you're on the stage, focus on the music and trust in yourself. And don't analyze, just perform. So go back to your breathing, just breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. Feeling the ground under your feet and the chair underneath you and at your back supporting you. And tell yourself, when you go out to perform, that you will perform to the best of your ability. And just slowly open your eyes and come back into the room. How many times would you do something like that? Just take a stop, you know, just stop everything and sit for a minute. My people in, in my psychology classes know that they do it because we do that quite a bit and we'll be doing more. It's really important. Find a balance and be aware of your needs. And then you will produce some really, really good work. Have, are there any questions just before we finish now? Because I know you're going into now the art of audition with, with Kathleen and with Darvla. Anybody got any questions that they'd like to ask? Is everybody okay? Great. Well, I hope that you found this useful and I wish you all the very best of luck. And I hope that I will um, look forward to enjoy to welcoming some of you into the Riam family. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and mind yourselves. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you take care now. Bye bye. So I've decided to come into the Zoom room. I'm hoping this is going to work from a sound point of view. Um, so Dervla is here as well. Unmute myself. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Where is Dervla? Oh, there she is. Hi. Hello. So Dervla and I are actually going to now, I mean, that session with Virginia was so beneficial. I feel calm myself. <laughs> really nice to feel like this on a Saturday afternoon. Um, Matthew and uh, Amy Rose and Caroline are all here with us and they've been really generous in sharing with us some extracts from arias that they recorded recently with Dervla. And we're, we won't watch all of them, but we will actually watch the entirety of Amy Rose's aria because it's just two minutes long. <laughs> and it's really nice to start with something that is complete. So the reason that we have Amy, Rose, Caroline and Matthew here is because I really want to get their feedback as well. Their kind of their ability to look at their own performance and evaluate it and even criticize it because this is a big part of what students in the academy learn to do by being part of our performance classes. So you learn to, to evaluate your own work and be able to assess it for yourself and you learn to evaluate other students work and be able to give feedback. So it's, it's a very positive environment. This is not about being negative in any way, but also by looking at other students work, you can learn an awful lot about yourself because we all have similar faults in relation to our posture or how we present ourselves or indeed our self-confidence when we perform. 
So we can learn enormously from observing other people. And Anna Elena was saying that in the session earlier today uh, with Owen, she was chatting about how beneficial it is, even if you're remote to watch the performance classes, you don't actually have to be in the room performing to benefit. So Sebastian Adams is here and he's assisting with all the technology today. So we're going to start by listening to Amy Rose. And Amy Rose, would you like to tell us what this ARIA is, please, before we start? Sure, so this piece is called Frère Voyer du Gai Soleil from Jules Massenet's Werther. And in this aria, the character of Sophie has come onto the scene after Charlotte and Albert have been married. Albert has made an attempt to make Werther feel better. He's a little bit down. He's very much in love with Charlotte. So being at that wedding was very difficult for him. Um, but Albert, of course, is, you know, I just got married. Love this, be happy. That didn't work. So Sophie comes onto the scene and sort of takes matters into her own hands and says, how can you be this miserable on a day like today? Look at it. So that's a little background. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Yes, lots of clapping going on there. It's such a vibrant aria, isn't it? It's just so full of life, so full of expression. And it suits you. And this is the first thing I would like just to comment here. It's really important to choose repertoire that you can identify with in opera, that the character actually fits you, that it, it suits your voice, it suits your range, and it suits your personality. Because as a young singer, when you walk into a room to sing for an audition, whether it's to join a degree program or a master's program or an opera studio or any of these things, the panel who are listening always want to hear you do your best. I can honestly say that. I always sit there with an open heart and a sense of expectation when a new singer walks into the room that I've never heard before. I always hope that I'm going to hear something really exciting and wonderful. And it happens frequently at the Royal Irish Academy of Music that a singer, we think, you know, Owen and Virginia and I have been on panels together actually in recent years, uh, selecting the students that come onto our degree programs at the undergraduate level. And sometimes we think that's it, we've definitely heard 
the best. Nobody else could surpass it. And another singer walks in the door and we go, oh my goodness, wow. And it's the wow, what is that wow thing? For me, it's very much the personality comes through in the singing. The real person is expressed through their singing. And Virginia was talking about that actually. Um, and it takes courage. It takes courage to allow your own personality to shine through when you perform. Um, and we help you with that in the academy. We help to develop that. But choosing the right piece of repertoire is also a huge advantage. So this aria that Amy Rose has chosen, I love the fact that it's only two minutes long because it's a great statement piece. You show an awful lot, Amy Rose, about your personality, about your voice and your ability to communicate in that aria. And the other thing about panels is if we like to have a balance. So if you're gonna sing a short French aria like that, we're not going to mind then if you sing a long da capo handle aria after it. But we might stop you if you sang two very long arias, one after the other. So it's finding that balance and that contrast is really, really important. Gervla, would you, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, um, hello everybody, first of all. Um, and the first thing I'd say is don't let your pianist, i.e. me, leave the water bottle beside the side of the piano if you're making a video. I didn't realize it was there until I looked at it there. Now, we weren't, but it didn't go to anybody, I think, Amy Rose. We didn't send it to the, to the whole world. Anyway, make sure your pianist does not do that. Um, no, I, our coffees, Dervla. Yeah, because this wasn't on the piano. That's definitely a no-no. At least I was good it was on the floor. No, seriously, the first thing I'd written down before we started this chat was exactly what Kathleen has just said. I wrote down that it, for auditions, choose in the areas that you want to sing, I'd underlined, and not what you think you should sing. So I think that is incredibly important, either when you're auditioning to come into us at the beginning, when you're 18, just leaving school, or the people... At the other going at the other end, Amy Rose and Carol, and people on the masses getting ready to audition for young artists programs. Either way, don't sort of say, Oh, I should have a slow, I have five, I have four slow hours, I better do a quick area. Oh, I've lots of Mozart, I better do something else. I mean, a lot of places will say, you know, um, contrasting repertoire, different languages, so you need to fit in a bit with that. But you know, if you cannot sing sad music, don't put in sad areas. If you can't sing really, really good color tour, don't put that in because you're going to be tripped up and somebody's going to, going, to, going, to, going to hear that. Put in what you feel represents you best. They will be contrasting. Even two Mozart's can be incredibly contrasting. Uh, an Aki Fools and a De Vieni or something. If they're different languages, we can be very clever and have contrast. Also, if we just sing everything very musically, we'll have plenty of contrasts anyway. You know, contrast is not just 20th century and a 16th century. So absolutely choosing the things, the things that suit you best is, uh, is, is the, first, um, the, the first, first thing on your list, you know? The other thing that strikes me um, at this, about Amy Rose is that you're, you have a very vibrant personality. It really comes across. Um, I, but I would say, be careful as, that you don't overuse gestures sometimes. I mean, I can see why you do it in this song and it's very clear. Oh, there's great intent in everything that you do, but you just want to be careful that it doesn't sometimes distract. You could get a little bit distracting so that you keep what Virginia was talking about, that sense of your presence and your core. Um, and Amy Rose has actually has a very good use of gesture, but some younger singers might get stuck. Sometimes we see people where they just have one gesture and they will do that no matter what they're singing about or you know, it's, it's almost like a nervous, it becomes a nervous thing. So just try and feel that whatever you do is very organic. You don't have to move your hands when you sing. I mean, it's great and it works in opera because you're a character. As Virginia said, you are that character. You're Sophie. You're not necessarily Amy Rose when you're singing that aria, even though you have that sparkly personality as well. But if you were singing something, a song, an English song, you know, you might need to have so much gesture. So it's just... Whatever you do, make it real for you. Don't don't add on anything that you feel is yeah. in any way yeah. false. You know, yeah. I was I was going to talk about that too, Kathy. I was going to again. I had gestures written down. You know, the 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 thing that you want to gesture about, put that into your voice. Put that into your body rather than putting it into a gesture. You know, if the if a gesture happens naturally and organically, that's fine. But it's much better if we, I see Matt Manning is smiling there, if Matt and I were working recently on some extra gestures that he was doing that, that he thought, well, I'm being figure I should do it or whatever reason. 
and then we put his arms away and what happened the voice flowed so much better grounded from from the bottom up because the the the, the his energy wasn't going into making these gestures this kind of stuff and whatever it's sure there's some organic ones are fantastic and when you're on stage as a character you're going to have to pick up a coffee cup and put it from here to here or whatever but gestures for the sake of gesture and even if they're coming out of you naturally try not doing them sometimes and just see what that does to the voice because and also as Kathleen says they distract and an, uh, uh, an audition panel or an audience we're, we're talking about audition panels now they get they get distracted by it and that's suddenly all the notices that you keep to conduct yourself with your right hand and your left hand doesn't work at all and they keep watching this rather than listening to your beautiful voices Something that um, the three of us actually, Kathleen Dervla and I were talking about yesterday was making the music happen. And it's a term that I heard years ago, but that's really come back into play in my own practice these days. And it's it has everything to do with making the gesture and the music work together. Um, I know when I first started working on this piece, the the opening I constantly went to try to get that F sharp just out there and make sure it was pinging and right where it needed to be. And um, when Dirkla and I got back into the room this year for our first coaching, I did that and she said, you know, now you're making a thing about it. Hmm. So mm. try something mm. else. Keep your arms mm. down. Keep, mm. And um, mm. it's, mm. it's sort of because it was, it was becoming effective because you were just always doing it. So it's the yeah. same thing every single time. So yes. again, if we are doing gestures in a way, they should be different every time because they should just be coming out of you at that exact moment. Whereas this was something Amy Rose had really practiced in at this stage, yes. you know, and then it didn't seem it had started as an organic, natural thing. And then it didn't seem natural anymore. It seemed affected. Funny. Yeah. Then it, then it was like, oh my gosh, I have to make this happen. <laughs> the other thing is, as well, uh, Amy Rose, is that now, of course, the emphasis is on video recording. Yeah. We're asking everyone to submit video recordings that are unedited. Yeah. Now, when you're sending in your auditions for the undergraduate, this year, we're only asking you to submit two pieces because of the circumstances circumstances that we're under and one of them will be an aria in Italian from the 17th or the 18th century and one of them will be a song in any language English French German that you feel comfortable singing in um, but it's just uh, there's sometimes it's really useful just to make an audio recording even just to listen to the audio of your video and see are you happy with the audio because you know, we, if you think back, video is, it's, it's, we're so used to it now, but there was a time when we only listened to audio recordings. We didn't have the live from the Met on our laptop all the time. And we didn't even have DVD and we needed to go, you know, we went to see the opera, we went into the theater or we could go into the cinema perhaps mm -hmm. and, and watch the live from the Met. But like I have boxes of CDs of recordings at home that I just listen to. And so I'm not seeing any gesture, physical gesture from that yes, singer. Yes, but okay. I actually can feel the emotion. Yeah, I know. Sure. I mean, I engage with the, the truth of what they're singing about just by listening to them. Yeah, and so yeah. I think it's really important that we keep that core that Derva is talking about. That yeah. sense of the voice, the singing, the communication through the text and the voice. And that we, we, the gesture grows out of that. But don't... Don't think just because you're making a video, oh my God, I better do a whole lot of stuff because- so it looks as if I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's it just sounds like you know what you're doing. It's just an interesting thing to think about. If you just put on the audio and walked away, is it your best singing? Just, just keep thinking, you want it to be your very best singing. Um, yep. So the, this, this is just focusing, Amy Rose, I'm not saying that everything that you did was extraneous because it wasn't, but it's just to actually just open that up for discussion yeah. and just uh, Kathleen as well if if you're a singer who doesn't ever gesture don't mm -hmm. feel you have to don't ever feel you have to you know because that chances are then you are putting it into your sound as Kathleen says the sound is by far the most important thing so don't ever you know sure you can't stand rigidly and sometimes we, we watch people's videos or we watch people stand and sing for us and we feel a rigidity in their bodies and you want to sort of make them open their arms and do something that's different you know that that means that they're stiff and they're not relaxed but if you're relaxing your body grounded 
you don't need to you don't don't ever feel you need to do anything is what i'm trying to say this is better to have it in your voice if there's some gestures it's fine but don't look at some singers and say oh, i love the way they do all these expressive things and i should too you shouldn't if that doesn't come naturally to you you shouldn't and again if you're in a in a production where you're going to have to be asked to do it then that would that would be different the director that's the other the thing work. because in a production and this is OK, it's highly unlikely that anyone applying to first year of our degree or access will already have sung a role in an opera. I wouldn't expect that. <laughs> OK, so that's the first thing. But what our students find is because they opera is incorporated through the whole of our program, as well as song and choral singing, all of the different elements are incorporated in. They grow in confidence with how their body language works for them. In, pre in presenting everything, I think. And if you have the, if you're fortunate that to sing a role in an opera where you have an aria that you sing, and you sing that aria again in an audition context, it's amazing. You will take that like, whole experience of being in that opera with you, walks into the room with you. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something you can't just have when you start out. But it's so interesting that you just take you. I can remember. Uh, D Dervla actually invited uh, the winner of the Veronica Dunn competition, Pumetsu Mitsushiko, into um, some years ago. And she came into a song class and she said, and she, Dervla said, would you, would you sing for the class? And she sang Dave Yaney and she sang uh, Mimi, I think. Mm. Yep. Our, and I honestly thought that I was transported into an opera house. And she didn't, she didn't have a lot of gesture, but she no. took everything of those two roles with her mm. and brought it into mm. the room it was absolute mm. magic. Mm. Mm. magic and she was like dressing her jeans or so she wasn't dressed up right there. she just no she was in her jeans to do a rehearsal just, in her jeans and a suitcase you know and actually she yeah. did what virginia was talking about she went into that place before yeah. she sang it was like she closed her eyes and she visualized mm. that mm. she was on the stage mm. in the opera house mm. where she'd been performing yeah. these roles and she just and then suddenly yeah. she was she was mm. Susanna. She was Mimi. It was just mm. phenomenal. So that I think that advice that you had from Virginia of being able to visualize yourself before you perform. Completely agree. It's really, yeah. really, really helpful. Yeah. And to remember a performance, even if this is, of course, you're going to be singing things in audition you've never sung before or that you're not, you haven't sung the whole role of. But trying we always ask our students to tell us the background of what they're singing about, which is exactly what Amy Rose did. She gave us a context for the character. She told us what was happening in the opera before she sang. She herself then was in her imagination, putting herself into that character in that opera, in her own headspace. So you can imagine this for yourself as well. You can create your own little virtual world <laughs> of the opera. Um, so I think what we'll do, Dervla, will we look we'll at move the- Something yep. completely different. I'd love to look at Matt, yep. Matt's recording, because um, it's actually very different. It's some Mozart. Uh, Matt, do you want to speak to us, please, about, about your extract? Yeah, um, my extract, I think the one I sent in is Aprite un po' quel occhi. It's Figaro's last aria, his third aria in the act four of Le Nozze di Figaro by Mozart. Um, at this point in the opera, um, Susanna, his wife, has been chased by the Count um, and the Count is trying to sleep with Susanna. And of course she's very faithful, but Figaro thinks that she's not. And she's playing a trick on Figaro um, because, you know, this is a Mozart opera, it's not <laughs> simple. Um, and she like, he hears her plotting, but she's actually plotting with the Countess to play a trick. Um, and he now thinks that Susanna is cheating on him. So this is his recit and Arya saying, oh, like women are horrible. This is a warning to all men, um, how I put my heart out. How long were they married for at this moment, Matt? How long have they been married for? How like, long have- An hour. Oh yeah, they they're married just for. married. Literally like, an hour or something. So he's, oh, yeah. he's, like, he's understandably really a bit pissed too? off with all of women. Yeah. Well, about an hour, it's all the same day. The opera's the same day. They're literally oh, yeah. married for about an hour and he thinks she passed a note to the count at the ceremony an hour before so of course he's pissed off and so it says well what are women the women are terrible like i'm I've just married to this girl and she's already cheating on me but you know what's what's the so then he has a tirade that all women are dreadful and poor men are just being you know used so badly by women so it's, it's very funny actually yeah he was entirely like, oh, untrue wedding day it does resolve itself but of course the story of Lenoxy de figaro is just a phenomenally 
amazing story and it is quite convoluted let's face it it's uh yeah. it's hard to explain it you know it's one of those things can you explain the entire story of Ignacio de Figaro without getting lost uh no but no. it's but so exciting and the characters are so interesting and who is Figaro Matthew who is he Figaro is um uh, one of the servants to the count yeah uh, so, and we've known him in a previous, you know, he was a barber as well. There's a, the Barber Seville, the Figaro, and that is the same character, even though Rossini's opera was written later. So, but he's a very feisty guy. Like he's a, you yeah. know, he doesn't suffer fools and he really is very, he's a very strong character. He's an interesting, very interesting kind of down to earth character. So Matt, we're going to listen to what we call the recitative, which is the introduction to the aria. And this, what do you want to explain in, in some way, shape or form? What's the difference between singing a recitative and singing an aria? Is there any difference? There is quite a difference in um, the fact that the recitative is kind of where the action happens in a lot, in the Mozart operas. It's where the plot moves forward and you've got a lot of text, you've got a lot of conversations um, and the way it's sung is a little bit different. It's more conversational than an aria where the aria will have two, three, maybe four lines of text and it's like this beautiful like expression of emotion, but the the recit is quite bitty. It, it stays within kind of an octave. It stays um, very simply musically, like sometimes accompanied by orchestra, mostly harpsichord and Mozart opera. Um, and so there's a yeah, lot it's, of text. It's where, the, it's where the action happens, really. It's a lot of action and a lot of text. So let's see how much of this text we actually can pick up on in Matt's performance. What a because then you go as you say you go into the aria and it's a totally you know so mm -hmm. there's so much information to be communicated here so the first thing i'm going to say i'm going to go back to the physicality to start with okay there's a lot of hands and there's really very little in your legs your legs for me are very kind of stuck in one place so for mm -hmm. a character that's so active you think about he's an he's a servant he's always having to run here and there and do the count's bidding I think it would you you need to think a little bit more about your having that more flexible grounded stance when you're singing. So there's not just the top of your body that's doing giving us the information. Um, and I think it will so that you can actually feel that you could move because when I look at it, I feel that you're never going to move. Your top <laughs> will move, your legs, your legs are stuck to the ground like as if you had super glue underneath your feet or something. Matt is running away from us in disgust. He's, he's, like, actually, he's actually moving. He's got to move room. It looks like. Yeah, Matt and I are in the academy and we've had to move rooms like three times. Okay. We're going to go on to Caroline. We're going to hear yep. something very different once again in a different language. Uh, no, it's in Italian, but a, a different composer. So Caroline, would you like to introduce your, your extract, please? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to sing, well, you'll hear me singing now, Prendi per me sei libero from Donizetti's Le Lesir d'Amore. Um, which is a, a sung by the character Idina, and it's her final aria in the opera. And she has spent the opera kind of, you know, telling them, or, you know, go away with yourself. No, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. No, no, go, you're annoying me now, and so on. She's playing hard to get. And then Nemorino is to go away, and she realizes 
that she is in love with him. So she um, buys his like military papers and essentially buys his freedom. And in this area, she's giving him his papers. She's giving him his freedom and he's a she's asking him to stay with her. Thanks, Caroline. It's, and this is a real revelation of her personality. Mm -hmm her real true self that we haven't seen in no. the whole opera, because she's it's, yeah, it's a completely really nasty, new guy to her. most of it, frankly, very <laughs> self-centered. So it's very interesting, this change of heart that we see here. So Caroline has suggested we listen to the, the opening section of this, and that's what, what we're going to do. Stop it there, Sebastian, okay? Caroline, thank you. This is so different, isn't it? It's a really, uh, such a, a a different challenge involved in this. Are, are you, because this is bel canto singing and it's all about this beautiful legato line. I really loved how you, I, lo I loved your demeanor at the beginning of the aria before you even sang at all. It was just so serene and I really wanted to hear you sing. So it's interesting that you created that expectation before you sang a note. And that's really impressive. And the one question I would have for you is, is she sad or happy in this aria? Um, she, I think she's a little bit ang like worried, like she's realized that she loves him and she knows the happiness that that can all bring, but she's just, she's longing for him to say yes and stay with her. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying, mm. but I think it would, I think this would benefit from you being more happier inside, having a sense of expectation that joy yeah. is on the way for both of you after this fractious relationship that you've had. And I think you, you start, you stand so beautifully when you start and then sometimes you drop, you know, you drop mm. and what Virginia was saying about opening up and just that sense of ownership of it of the of the music being inside you of the emotion being inside you it's just a small little thing but it you sometimes you lose it as you progress and then it makes the legato line more difficult to sustain from a technical point of view so that's that's a that's quite a technical thing but also it's just just keep that beautiful posture that you have at the beginning don't don't let it fall away from you you know once you establish it because it's yeah. It's, it's lovely, it's just so lovely to see that. And it's, and it's just a small thing, but it's just, if you can do it. And it, also you, you start with such confidence. So you already have us on side completely. So just then keep that, don't let it go. Keep that sense of posture, that confidence in the storytelling. Cause it's really, it's really beautiful. 
suits you so well. Durbler, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I completely agree with you. I mean, first of all, it's a great area for an audition. Um, it's not very long. Again, I agree with Kathleen about, uh, you know, bringing two, two very long pieces or whatever to auditions. People, again, know quite quickly what they like. So also this has a slow section and then it has a very uh, short fast section. So it's, it, it, it does show this kind of contrast in one, in one piece. Um, I think it was very interesting what you said about the stance, Kathleen, because I think the stance and the airflow all go together for all of you. So if you are moving your stance a little bit and slightly collapsing, sometimes that's the airflow also collapsing. And I can say it's because Karen and I have talked a lot about this and it's a technical thing that I think she's, she's working a lot on. Keeping that lovely airflow that happens, the beginning it happens sometimes and just keeping it consistent. And stance will really help with that. Um, what you said, Kathleen, about Karen standing beautifully at the beginning, there's obviously, you know, a, a, it's a quite a long play in with the orchestra in this area. And often you're going to have that or you're going to have outros, either intros or outros of the orchestra with the piano. And especially for you younger people starting off, um, always remember that that's, that is your music. So you have to own that music as much as the music you sing yourselves. So I might be playing it or an orchestra, but I'm not I'm, it's 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 not disconnected from 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 you at all. So as soon as I start to play that, I'm not just playing, playing it because it's nice music. I'm playing your thoughts. I'm playing Adina. I'm playing Adina's tune, you know, and sometimes it really is like in certain operas where there is a light motif and we get, you know, that music that always goes with that character the whole way through. It happens quite a lot of operas actually. So just, just, and it helps you to settle in and be ready to sing that first note because you have that support of the of the of the piano with you, and again, remember you, you're not you're never fighting the piano or the orchestra. The piano and the orchestra are supporting you before you sing. Even they're saying, "Look, this is the lovely melody. Come in and join me. Come in and sing this with me." And I think just and that is I think what Karen's doing there. She's listening to that lovely music and internalizing it, and and and, and then she's set up really well to start because this is a phenomenally difficult start to this area. Actually, the way it goes, but Andy, and she does it really well because it is. of that. And it yeah. It's great to have had a different example where there is a long introduction where you have to be completely in the character where we're curious. I was really curious about what you were going to sing about because I felt yeah. you were in, you were thinking, you were in character all the way. Yeah. And as Derva said, it's an enormous support to have that and to breathe yeah. into it and then sing out of it. But yeah. all of these bel canto arias are so challenging when the beginnings of them frequently are really difficult. You've got yeah. to do cadenzas or you've got to do something very elegant and beautiful and and mm -hmm. you have to have enormous self-confidence to to be able to breathe deeply as Virginia would say not let the anxiety get in the way connect into the piano and yeah. and then sing from your heart which yeah. you know it's it's yeah. all in there Caroline there was so, it was really it was, it's just so just keeping that then not yeah. letting go of it because yeah. it's because yeah. that is for me like that's the scariest open there for an hour <laughs> and all and like when when like if I feel like I didn't, I didn't do it as well as I can. Like it kind of, it does knock you a little bit for the next phrase and so well, on. That's what you've got. To, the next thing is, and we will have to finish now because we have to go on. But the thing is, don't if your opening phrase in the first thirty seconds isn't your best, don't give up. Yeah, that's true. So, do you know something? Yeah. Take the next breath and just yeah. make the next yeah. one better. Because yeah. the thing is that all of us yeah. start things and we go, oh no, that wasn't my best. Yeah. But look. Just take another breath and say, this will be, be better. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't, don't give up. Collapse. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, and, but it's very honest of you to admit that because that's mm -hmm. it's a very co common thing to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to finish this session now because I don't, you know, because we could talk about all of these extracts and we've been here a lot today. Kathleen, and I just before, want to take- Before we go, Kathleen, um, yes. it's Caroline's birthday. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Rose. Aww. Happy birthday, Caroline. I think if we all sing, it'll just be dreadful because we'll all be in different time things and everything else, you know, the lack of synchronicity will be shocking. But hey, happy birthday. That's really nice that you actually gave your time today to be here on your birthday. I genuinely appreciate that. That's really very generous of you. Um, I'm going to take, listen, we're going to wrap up the day. It's been so wonderful to have you joining we're going to save this, uh, the essence of what we did today. So if other people who couldn't be here today want to join or see it or watch any of it, we will be able to share that. Do any of you have any further questions like that you want to ask at this point? 
that are kind of, oh, I really wanted to ask that question. Um, or if you don't, and it occurs to you tomorrow or the next day or the next day, you can email me, Kathleen Tynan at RIAM.ie, um, and ask me that question. In any event, I'm going to write to everybody that joined today just to say hello. And if you have any other questions, that's really, you know, Deborah's now put, put my email up there on the screen. Everybody can see it. But I will be writing to you because sometimes the questions occur to you afterwards. And if you have friends that couldn't come today, that really are curious about coming to study at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, we have until the 1st of December, guys. You know, we're, we're the first virtual open day. We were the brave guinea pigs. And, but we now have an advantage because we have longer to generate more interest. So please spread the word, tell your friends, contact me if you need any more information. And let's, you know, generate. We had a huge amount of applications last year. We actually have 10 singers in first year. That's the largest student cohort we've ever had in a first year of our, of our degree program for singers and an equal number of male and female singers. So the, both of those things fill me with great joy, I have to say. So I'm hope I'm really have full of expectation that next year we will have just as an exciting uh, level of application for our degree programs. Does anybody have a question that they, they would like to ask? A burning question. No, uh, I might have a question, but there, I mean, I have a few questions, but there's like, they're like pretty specific to the application process and I guess my situation. So maybe would it be better if I wrote to you or? Yes, that would probably be the best. We're going to, at the end of this, we're going to run a little kind of generic video about how do you apply? That might answer mm -hmm. some of your questions, which is helpful. But otherwise you can, of course, um, write directly to me with very specific right. questions. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to thank, sincerely thank Owen Gilhooley, Dervla Collins, Virginia Kerr, um, all from the faculty who contributed. I mean, I think today was very interesting, uh, the, the, all the different contributions. I want to thank all of our students who are here today and who stayed actually, you know, to listen to the whole session, even though they're already on our courses. So Anna Elena and David and Caroline and Amy Rose and Matt, and Neve, who was here earlier, thank you so much for joining and sharing your experiences of what it's like to study at the Academy with other people. Because to be honest, you are the best ambassadors for our degree program. Whether you're actually on our course or, you're, or the graduates who have gone on to greater things, they are all our ambassadors and they spread the word for us. And without the exceptional work that they do, uh, we wouldn't have any reputation, frankly. Our reputation rests on our students and their success and their engagement with what we offer at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. So I'm going to say goodbye for now and Sebastian is going to roll the credits and <laughs> have a nice evening everyone. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. I really encourage each other international students to come here to the Academy to study because I think it's a very good place to study music and in my opinion it can be considered one of the greatest places in Europe to study music. And one thing I like from the Academy is that we get two hours a week of piano lessons or instrument lessons, which I think is the only place in Europe we have this. I love this course because it's so broad and there's none other like it in the country and there's so many performance opportunities for me. I study at the Academy because they teach you to play with great style and finesse.